let's play this Nikki Haley thing because this fits into what I wanted to to talk with you about, Jamel. Um, just how uh, Vivek went d- took the maximalist positions on all of you know the most. Uh, br- brutish uh, Republican impulses, whether it be uh, just being incredibly, you know, saying I want Israel's border policies down at the Mexico border or uh, uh, saying the climate change agenda is a hoax. Right. So giving the red meat to the base. And, and he has the ability to do so with no real political background. It's just it's all theater for him. And he's auditioning for, I don't know, some the cable news show or VP or something <laughs> like that. But, but, but this, the, the difference between the, what you're seeing growing within the base um, and the, the establishment Republicans and what their true agenda is, is really fascinating. You saw a little bit of it in the um, back and forth between Vivek Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley on um, Ukraine uh, with the, the differences between the more traditional neoconservative uh, pro uh, Pentagon kind of uh, military industrial complex thinking and this libertarian uh, uh, leaning uh, ideology, I guess. But also what they didn't flesh out is Nikki Haley and Chris Christie and some of the other traditional Republicans want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Um, is that this the clip uh, of, of Nikki Haley on Social Security and Medicare? Let's play this because uh, this is just a reminder. Yeah, this is not the one. Um, it's the other one. Yeah. This is a reminder of exactly what the Republican Party agenda is when essentially Trump is out of the well, picture and isn't disciplining them. Um on this issue because he kind of cut out Republicans legs in these latest negotiations with Biden out from under them when he said uh, we shouldn't touch Social Security and Medicare. But this is really what they want to do. Well, you know, you've got multiple candidates on that stage that said they wouldn't touch entitlements, including Trump. And any candidate that says they're not going to touch entitlements means that they're basically going to go into the go into office and then leave America bankrupt. Social Security is going to go bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare is going to go bankrupt in eight. So the way we deal with it is we don't touch anyone's retirement or anyone who's been promised in. But we go to people like my kids in their 20s when they're coming into the system and we say the rules have changed. We change retirement age to reflect life expectancy. Instead of cost of living increases, we do it based on inflation. We limit the benefits the on the wealthy and we expand Medicare Advantage plans. What's the right age there then, Ambassador? Well, I think we have to do the numbers. We've got to figure out what it is. But what we do know is 65 is way too low yeah. and we need to increase that. We need to do it according to life expectancy. Yeah, as Matt says, life expectancy is going down. Um, and also there are studies that show that the longer you work, the shorter your life expectancy can be. Almost as if, you know, uh, having to work until your elder years is not great for your health. And just to fact check her, no Social Security and Medicare are not going bankrupt. Yet the Social Security Trust Fund is a little bit more in like financial precarity because of Treasury bonds. But that is quite easily fixed uh, by just raising the cap. There are a lot of things that you can do, but this is just this is the austerity agenda of the Republican Party that is as foundational to what they believe in as anything else. That's right. I mean, the Trump's to the extent that Trump had like any innovation when he in the 2016 race, it was sort of jettisoning all of that. Right. Saying, you know, saying to voters, basically, like, I know you're I know you're here for the anti-immigrant stuff. I know you're here for sort of like the meanness and everything. So I'm going to focus on that. I know you don't want to hear someone talk about taking your Medicare or Social Security. That's very unpopular. So I'm not going to do it. Um, and that that work. And it is fascinating to see that, you know, when he's not on the stage, they just go back to talking about it, kind of unaware that it's um, – and that it's politically unpopular. I think in Haley's case, he's trying to present herself as sort of the only serious adult on the stage, though, as you as you as you say, the claim she's making about those programs, they're going to go bankrupt in some way. I uh, just don't really hold up to scrutiny. Like, how can if Social Security goes bankrupt, the program that more or less is financed by existing workers paying taxes to mm-hmm. current beneficiaries. So if that goes bankrupt, what that means is that like society is collapsed, right? Yes, <laughs> that's, that's what that means. It's self um, Sustaining. I mean, it's right. in theory, but, you know, they want to be able to cut into it and, and create more leverage for people to remain in the workforce. That's their agenda. 
That's right. And to and to siphon siphon the money um, into private accounts that you know mutual funds and private equity can like sk- skim off of for their own profit. So yeah, that's that's the agenda. It's very unpopular. Um, uh, and they cannot help but go back to it, which I think gets, gets to this point of kind of just like an intellectual exhaustion among mainstream Republicans that is being that has been papered over really by uh, by Trump's uh, dominance of the entire Republican Party. It, it feels like I'll say it feels to some extent that all of this is like very theoretical in terms of talking, because as you as you said at the top, Trump leads the field by like 40 points, right? Like he's there's Nikki Haley, I think, is pulling three or four percent in the polling. Ron DeSantis, who's supposed to be like his closest Trump's closest competitor, is pulling 11, 12 percent. Like no one. Trump is winning the majority of Republicans and no one else really even comes remotely close. And so this this feels all a little academic, like at the end of the day, you know, even if he is, you know, faces considerably more legal trouble than he does. There's nothing that says you can't run for president and also um, uh, be in court. So there's a good chance that he, he still gets the nomination and it is is the nominee going into going into next fall. And all of this is a little a little moot. And I think you're right that. On Wednesday, everyone kind of perceived that this was like a very strange exercise and pretending as if the actual unquestioned leader of the Republican Party uh, isn't you know, part of this discussion. Yeah, and it just it's it, it, it's so clear that the Republican base, there's no appetite for cutting Social Security and Medicare, no matter how much they want to call it entitlements, no matter how much they want to obscure it. Um, that was always all the hatred of um, non-white people, of gay people, of trans people always was a way to get them to a position where they could deliver for their donors, for the people that they serve. Uh, it was cynical. Some are true believers, some aren't. I don't know how much it matters. Um, but in the end, the Republican base really just wanted like the hatred part. And that's what Trump delivers to them. Uh, and so when the Republican Party or someone like Nikki Haley is trying to move back to like what the talk watered down Tea Party talking points, I mean, it just she seems like a dinosaur and completely disconnected from anything that regular Republicans actually want their candidate to sound like. I think that's right. Um, I, I, I don't I don't put much stock into uh, Vivek Ramaswamy's chances, but he he's like the only one who seems to kind of grasp that the Republican base is kind of moved on from the 2010s and is looking for something bombastic, for something that involves like defining and targeting enemies and promising that you're going to use the government to go after them, which is basically what what he did. Climate change activists are enemies. I'm going to go after them. Um, uh, federal bureaucrats are enemies. I'm going to go after them and so on and so forth. So I think I think that's what Republican voters want to hear. And Ramaswamy is delivering it. DeSantis is kind of delivering it, although not particularly well. But any attempt to articulate kind of a updated version of uh, Tea Party Republicanism, circa 2012 Republicanism, kind of the the kind of rhetoric that Mitt Romney ran on in that election, um, or that you know the other Republican candidates ran on in 2016, I just don't think it's going to land very well with voters who or Republican voters who um, don't want that. And part of the problem is they don't want that and they want a candidate who's going to deliver it to them. But most voters don't want that. Uh, what most voters don't want what Republican voters want. Uh, and so that puts the nominee in a difficult position. Just to, to make one quick point about that debate, it was interesting, right, that they had this whole exchange about abortion, which kind of hinged around Haley really trying to get ev- everyone to not talk about it. Yep. Um, uh, uh, because she recognizes that, like, listen, this is electoral poison. But it, this but, is but the, everyone like, had to mansplain it to her, right? They had to right. mansplain <laughs> why the federal abortion was needed. <laughs> um, <laughs> federal abortion ban, I should say. But this is like the dilemma, right? Republican yeah. voters want to hear a nominee say, I'm going to get to Washington and I'm going to ban abortion. And uh, the, most of the voting electorate hears that and they say, no, thank you. And yeah. um, uh, they will vote the other way. It was interesting. I think it was really only Pence and Asa Hutchinson who said that they would do a federal abortion ban. And the rest of them, you know, say... 
well, we'll leave it to the states. But for honestly, just to say to to have another moment of positive uh, feelings about like the general American population on this front, um, just like them having their uh, taking their civic duty seriously when it comes to being on a jury, it's they understand now that the I think the Republicans are lying about the states' rights thing um, because the, the, they. The, Lindsey Graham did them a favor <laughs> by proposing that that 15 week ban uh, basically uh, qu quite quickly uh, after Roe was overturned, uh, much to the, the, the dismay of Mitch McConnell and others. But, um, you know, th there's there's no trust there on this issue and abortion rights are broadly popular. And we'll see what happens in Ohio uh, in November. Right. When they take uh, right. take that up on the ballot. But the the this is a really ma Trump is a losing issue for them if he's the candidate, obviously. And abortion is. And this is perhaps the 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 saving grace for Biden, who in any other time would be a weak candidate. Um, but but he has great negative partisanship on his side and the twin issues of like the democracy at stake and your abortion rights at stake. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we'll also want to look to the Virginia uh, state elections in the fall where the Republican governor, Glenn Youngkin, is really investing a lot in trying to flip the state house and hold the state uh, or flip the state Senate and hold the state house delegates. If he can do that, then he'll have the votes to do an abortion ban. So this this election in Virginia is really being fought on the question of abortion rights. All the Republicans are doing as much as they can to avoid talking about it. Um, I think if Democrats can hold, can hold the state Senate, uh, then that will also be a, give us a sense of where the public is in terms of, you know, how they connect Republicans winning elections to the future of their rights.